Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yenap General, and welcome to our Total War Warhammer 2 Legendary Lord lore video on Helbrun. Now, in order to tell the story of Helbrun, we really have to get into a little bit of the setting and the time. Now, like many of the Elven stories, to really tell the story of Helbrun properly, we have to go back to the story of Anarion, the great hero of Elven people, both Dark and High Elves, and even Wood Elves to a certain degree. Now, Anarion was the first Phoenix King, and we're going to cut his story a little bit short. So we're just trying to set the scene here. When the initial chaos invasion happened in the Warhammer world, before that there was no chaos, nothing of it existed on the planet, and then the two polar gates exploded, and chaos poured through these warp gates. So Anarion, uh, he ended up fighting them off, but in order to do so, he had to make some compromises, and he ended up pulling what's known as the Sword of Cain, the elven god of murder. Now, this is said to have darkened his heart slightly, and he became enamored with the idea of slaughter. For a lot of people, Anarion saved the day he won with the help of his mate Kalidor, who he kind of turned against a little bit at the end, but Kalidor Dragon Tamer put together the Vortex, which for those of you who played Total War Warhammer 2 will be very familiar with, uh, that sucks out all the Exos Chaos energy, stopping demons and the like from forming in the Warhammer world, at least in vast numbers enough to overrun the entire planet. So they ended up fighting together, they saved the day, and Anarion eventually disappeared. Now, Anarion had one son, as far as he was aware, when he disappeared. Later on, his two initial children from his first wife, the Everqueen, would be brought back. But at the time he disappeared, he only had one son, and that was Malekith. Now, Malekith was the son of Marathi, as many of you will be familiar. When Anarion disappeared, there was a choice of who would be the next Phoenix King. And a lot of people just didn't want another Anarion, because he'd become particularly bloodthirsty, battle-hungry, and no one wanted a repeat of that, and so they shunned his son Malekith. Now, Malekith seemingly took this very well at the time, and, you know, kind of still was the prince of the elven kingdom of Nagareth up in the northwest of Ulfwan. So he was still running that, the seat his father held, where his father set up his court and sort of held the line against chaos. So he took over that kingdom, and after a while decided to go traveling around the world. Now he went to visit some of the elven colonies in what we know as the Old World, in the areas of sort of Britonia and the Empire and stuff like that. And in doing so, he saved one colony that was completely besieged by orcs that the Phoenix King at the time uh, did not send any reinforcements to, and this was the colony of Athol Turalyon. Now, Athol Turalyon, in millennia to come, would become known as Marienburg to you and I, but at that point, it was just Athol Turalyon. It was a wonderful elven colony with huge towers overlooking the coast, great for shipping, a great sort of trading town. And they were just completely beset by orcs, but Malekith arrived to save the day, and from that day forward, they really dedicated themselves to Malekith, and it became really a colony of the princedom of Nagareth. And these people ended up calling themselves Nagarothi. Now, this might be confusing because, as many of you know, the Dark Elves later on go on to colonize a place they called Nagaroth, and then they still call themselves Nagarothi there. But this is before any of that happens. Malekith is still in goods with the Phoenix King. He's just wandering the colonies, trying to help out where he can, and he ends up running this colony known as Athol Turalyon. Now, Athol Turalyon prospered. It grew immensely after Malekith helped lift this huge orc siege, and he's kind of ran the place for 1,300 years, and they're all happy. Everyone loves Malekith. It's all going fantastically well. And then after that 1,300 years, Malekith decides that he is actually going to venture into the northern wastes. And he kind of disappears off. In this time, he's made alliances with the dwarves. He's done the stuff like that that you guys have maybe heard me speak about in other videos, such as the video for Grombrindle. Uh, but he just disappears off to the north, and he leaves uh, one of his trusted lieutenants, a chap by the name of Alandrian, in charge of Athel Turalyon. So Alandrian, been with him when he'd made contact with the dwarves, is running this city-state. And he is eventually elevated to the position of a prince of Nagareth. Uh, so he's kind of underneath Malekith, but still a prince in his own right. And he's running it successfully for 50 years, and over the course of this time, he eventually has a couple of children. Now, he has two daughters, one by the name of Helbrun, and one by the name of Lyrieth. 
So Helbron and Lyrith are two sisters. They're living an idyllic life in a lovely elven city as the daughters of the prince of the city. And, you know, they're in the lap of luxury. They have servants. They have a huge mansion. Everything's going rather well for them. And they're hitting their sort of adolescent years. I'm not sure how old that you are to be an elf in your adolescent years, but they're hitting their adolescent years. And eventually, you know, they're sort of playing around in Helbron's room. And Helbron has a couple of friends over. And she has her trusted maid. I think it's Lillian uh, sort of brushing her hair and they're just kind of gossiping about the goings on of the day, who likes who, who might marry which prince, whatever have you, sort of giggling away to themselves when suddenly there's a huge commotion outside and they sort of all look out the window overlooking the whole city and they see this beautiful fleet of ships coming in and one gigantic ship in particular is coming in and the whole town is in a furore over who this might be so you'll rush down to the quayside see what's going on and there's a huge crowd gathered by this time now helbron and lyrieth being you know particularly tall helbron being the older by 20 years but both sisters were quite tall and could get a clearer view than their adolescent friends over what was going on and they sort of report back oh my god they're stepping off the ship who is it who is it is it the Phoenix King or is it somebody else? And uh, lo and behold, it is Malekith and his mother Marathi. Now, Malekith, not particularly ever being a friendly guy, let's put it that way, uh, kind of gets off the boat and instead of sort of greeting the adulating crowd, fires off a magical lightning bolt into the sky to kind of clear the way. It's like, kind of get out my way as he sort of gets off the ship and sort of trudges towards the government capital of the city to get some work done, followed by his mother swiftly behind. And the girls are just absolutely overcome by the sheer beauty and glamour of Marathi and the adulation with which the crowd treats her. All eyes are focused on her. They're like, oh my god, this woman is the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. I want to be just like her when we grow up. They sort of gossip and go like this. The two sisters being daughters of a prince decide that, you know, what would be great is if we could be taken back to the capital of Nagarif and play a part as, you know, ladies-in-waiting or handmaidens to Marathi herself. That would be a fantastic step up for us socially. And we might meet some wonderful elder batches on Ulfwan and, you know, settle down there and become, you know, even more important than we are here, which is admittedly in the colonies. It's not the most prestigious of cities around the Warhammer world at the time. So they decide to, uh, at least Helbron in particular, decides to make an appointment with Marathi to try and make a play for being one of her women in waiting to join her court, really. So she sets about, kind of, you know, greases the wheels, asks for her father's help and gets an appointment with Marathi while she's staying there. So fast forward a little bit and we're joined outside of Marathi's chambers. Now, Helbron is a nervous wreck. She is about to meet Her Majesty Marathi, the wife of Anarion, the greatest savior the elves have ever known, the beauty, the splendor that is Marathi in all her glory. And she's about to walk into the same room as this woman. She's fidgeting away. She doesn't know what to do with herself. And then suddenly one of Marathi's attendants turns around the corner and says, Marathi, will see you now. The attendant escorts Helbron into the room and Helbron walks in to meet Marathi spread out on a chaise longue. And after a very nervous exchange of pleasantries, Marathi just cuts to it and goes, Look, Princess of Afalterallion, what is it you want from me? Why have you all requested this meeting? And Marathi simply says, I wish to be part of your circle. I wish to travel to you of you to Analek and uh, join your court there. And Marathi just chuckles to herself, a hearty chuckle that carts Helbron to her heart, just absolutely destroys her self-esteem. Why would I associate myself with you? Marathi proposed to her. What do you possibly have to offer me? Do you know any magic? And she sort of timidly pipes up, with very little, your majesty. Um, it's not the best place to really learn magic out in the colonies. Perhaps under your tutelage I could. And she cuts her off and says, no, you could not. If your magic gifts haven't shown themselves by now, your latent magic ability would be of no use to me. What else can you do? Sing? And she's like, not, not, not really fantastically well, your majesty. Poetry, perhaps? No, not at all, your majesty. Dance? And she says, I'm not, I'm not the most graceful, your majesty. And Marathi looks at her, still judgingly in a mockingly derisive way, and just says, Honesty is a rare trait, I like that about you, but you offer me nothing at 
all. Who are you to think you have a place in my circle? You are nothing and nobody. At this point, Helbrun is trying with all her might to keep in her tears. She's not going to cry in front of this woman who seems set on tormenting her. Marathi looks at her and goes, Good effort, my dear, but I can see your lips quivering. You are already broken, and promptly proceeds to begin to shove her out of the front door. Pity won't sway me either, princess. You are nothing but a weak and spoiled child. Remember this shame, remember your frailty in this moment. This world belongs to the strong, and you are certainly not one of them. You have nothing but an unremarkable destiny in front of you, and tomorrow I won't even remember your name. And she shoves her out into the hall and closes the door behind her. At this point, Helbrun just burst into tears. She was absolutely destroyed. But after a few moments, she collects herself and pity gives way to rage. And rage fuels her as she straightens herself out and marches out onto the streets of Athel Turalyon. On the way home, she vowed to herself that she would prove Marathi wrong. She would show that fate had a remarkable destiny in mind of her. She would show her value. She would show that she could be better even than Marathi herself. And so she set about trying to find ways to prove herself to Marathi and to prove herself even better than that conniving bitch. So, she starts to think of ways, but stuff starts to elude her. She can't be good at magic. She's not good at the stuff she says she is. No matter how much she tries, she can't really get better in those elements. Weeks turn into months, and she starts to run out of ideas. Now, one evening, her sister comes home with this captain of the guard, known as, I think it's May Maynedril. Now, Maynedril is a captain who her sister has been seeing for a while. He's tall, handsome, he has a great military future ahead of him, and she kind of praises her sister for making this choice of lover. And they come to her and they say, Sister, you need to come to this thing we've been at. It will blow your mind. And, you know, as you do in kind of Nagarofi society, Helbrun was like, look, guys, I like an orgy as much as the next elf in this city, but I'm not really in the mood tonight. And also, sister, it's always weird when you're involved in the same orgy as me. It's never very cool. It's a bit incestuous. It's not really my bag. And her sister goes, no, you silly goose. This isn't another orgy. We have something new and you are going to love it. You have to come with us. And so reluctantly, more out of curiosity than anything else, uh, Helbrun agrees to go with Lyrieth, and they go to see whatever this captain has in store, the sister having already been to it, knowing what it is. So they ride out of town a small ways, and they start to get towards this sort of fire in the woodland, and there's this odd smell around the fire, and Helbrun can't quite place the smell. She's a little bit curious about it, and eventually they get to a clearing with a bonfire in the middle of it, and this is where things start to get interesting. In the clearing, there are a good number of elves gathered, all mostly hooded and cloaked. And out of the tree line emerges what must have been some 700-year-old elf, completely naked, apart from loincloth, which seemed completely stiffened and covered in dried blood. He steps out of the woodland with ten attendants following him, and every elf in the clearing crosses their arms and yells the words, Praise Cain! And then out of the darkness, there's just this braying, like, scream that sounds like a goat being slaughtered. And it's just coming closer and closer and closer, and Helbrun doesn't know what it is. And then out of the tree line emerges more attendants, holding a bound and tied beastman among their number, hauling him towards the elderly-looking naked elf. And the elf who stood in the middle got out a ceremonial blade, and he said, Praise tonight, for tomorrow we cure our enemies. At that point, what had been going around the crowd was some kind of nocturne and Helbrun took some in her mouth and suddenly her clothes felt heavy and weighted and felt like they were tearing at her skin so she and many others in the crowd around begin to tear off layers of their clothing as the crowd begin to build into this terrible furore and the beastman was braying and then suddenly the priest plunges his dagger into the chest of the beastman digging in there and pulls out the beastman's heart and letting its blood flow 
below. The blood was all collected in a massive goblet, while the heart itself was thrown in the fire. And yet again, the crowd yelled, Praise Cain! Praise Cain! Praise Cain! And the goblet started to be passed around the crowd, each taking a sip. Now, Helbred ended up being a position where she was the last of everyone to get a slip and she was so excited by the prospect of this so caught up in the moment in the ceremony that she drank all of it that was left the crowd reacted with a bit of a gasp and they were like what have you done the last drop is always for Cain himself she approaches the priest and says I apologizes for what she's done let me offer my own blood and she cuts herself and pours her own blood in the goblet to be given to Cain for the blood she accidentally took. The entire evening from that point descended into an absolute frenzy with dancing, with praises of Cain, with prayers to Cain going up in the night. And then by the time it started to die down, Helbrun knew how she could raise herself amongst the ranks, how she could challenge Marathi, and this was going to be it. She had found religion and went up to what must have been the priest of Cain after the ceremony and said, please, priest, Teach me the ways of Cain, for I want to learn. And the priest says, I've seen Cain's touch upon you. It is rare indeed. If you still feel the same tomorrow once you've gone to bed, I will gladly take you under my wing and teach you. And so Helbrun and her sister retired back to their mansion and she went to bed and awoke in the morning with the same ambition burning in her heart and she went to start to learn the ways of Cain from the priest. Now at this point it's worth mentioning that the worship of Cain is kind of looked down upon everywhere else in elven society except for in Nagarif, obviously Malekith's province, and kind of the colonies controlled by Nagareth. So Helbrun's city is kind of an odd one out, whereas everyone else seems Cain as a rather negative god, as the god of murder for the elves, because it's the idea is that Cain's the one who corrupted an Aryan to make an Aryan not the kind of bright shining hero he once was and made him participate in all kinds of cruelty towards the latter stages of his life. So really it's only in the sort of Nagarothi cities and colonies that the worship of Cain is kind of tolerated semi-openly, whereas everywhere else looks down upon it. Anyway, Helbrun goes to learn the ways of Cain from the priest, and she spends a hundred days studying under him. Now, a lot of it's to do with putting together the herbs and spices that's used in the worship of Cain. A lot of it has to do with learning how to just kill things straight up from different species. And there's a great bit where she's taking apart a gobbo and learning how the best way to kill a gobbo. And the other aspect of it is learning the sort of praises and prayers of Cain to say out in the battlefield and how to correctly do them. So those are the studies she's doing in, and she dedicates a hundred days to doing this. At that point, the priest believes he really has nothing left to teach her in this context, in the classroom setting, and he puts a proposal to her, and he says, Helbrun, look, the army's about to march out. A priest of Cain usually accompanies an army. I'm going to go out with them. I think you need to get your hands dirty. Come out and do field work with me and that will be your final lessons in the teachings of Cain. So, if you want to do it, let's go. If not, that's perfectly fine as well. And she goes off to ask her father, Landrian, whether she can do this or not. And he initially is actually very accepting. He himself is a worshipper of Cain. He's completely on board with the worship of Cain. And he's like, okay, daughter, go and learn this thing, but you have to do it on two conditions that I'm going to set. The first condition is you have to take your sister with you. And Helbrun was a bit taken aback like this. She was like, this was my dream. I don't want to force my sister into it. And he's like, no, no, take your sister. And indeed, her sister had been taken with the Cain ceremony and agreed to go with her. But Helbrun's one condition was, I won't take my sister. She doesn't want to go. Luckily, the sister did want to go with her. And her father said, the second condition is that while you're out there, darling, you have to learn the tool of Cain, warfare. 
Learn everything you can about warfare when you're there in the field and absorb those lessons while you can. Other than that, go out, be merry. I'm sure you'll make me very, very proud. And he kind of sends her off with the elf army of Athel Turalyon, and they set off on patrol and kind of on raiding missions as well around the old world, looking to bring riches into the city and, you know, fend off any hostile armies that are close by. So that's what they go off to do, and they march out of the gates of the city on to further adventures. Helbrun's first battle was to the south of the city against a gathering horde of beastmen. The Dark Elves took them on while Helbrun and the priest chanted the incantations of Cain, bringing strength to the warriors all around them. And indeed, that day, the Elves were victorious. They had won out, and they started to sacrifice all the prisoners they'd taken, and for days afterwards, the pyres of Cain burnt high into the night sky and Helbrun realized she'd made the correct choice. Moving on from that battle, there were many battles to follow, and over the course of the next 20 years, Helbrun traveled with the army, drilling by day with her sister, doing spear drills, holding the line, learning different methods of combat within a fighting unit, and by night they were regaled with the tales of Anarion from the Priest of Cain, learning the different incantations, learning the different drug mixtures, and really just completely immersing themselves in the study of Cain. Now, over the course of this 20 years, they returned to their home city three times in total. The first time, she was still a little bit shy. She just had a couple of battles under her belt and just hid amongst the army itself, trying not to stand out. By the second time she returned, she was already a full priestess and was really trying to go for it and stand out. It's like, this is me, I've arrived. I'm a priestess of Cain. And the two sisters had actually earned themselves a bit of a reputation for their sort of killing ability and their sort of vigor and fervor during any sort of ceremonies and anything like that and they soon became known as the Daughters of Murder and she wore this nickname very proudly with her sister however victory upon victory for this army started to wane on the general population and by the time they returned for the third time people had kind of lost interest they took victory as kind of a given they're just like oh yeah another victory parade oh well and no crowds would turn up and this very vexed Helbrun. She thought, this isn't right. We're out there fighting. The crowd should be full of adulation for us. They should be delighted every time we return. This kind of sucks. Now, over the course of their travels, they came across the armies of other colonies, and although instructed not to speak to the other colonies because the worship of Cain was looked down upon among them, Helbrun was an ambitious young priestess and was actually trying to spread the word to other colonies. She'd find those who would listen amongst the other elven armies and try to convert them. Now, this made the priest who was teaching them a little bit angry that his orders were being disobeyed, and this is kind of the first crack we see in the relationship between this priest and Helbrun and her sister. Now, in any given battlefield, when the chanting was going on, the priest would often be the one leading the chant. Now, Helbrun didn't like having to sort of stand in with the spear line when this was going on. She wanted to be up there. She didn't want to be one of a group. And so her and her sister started trying to learn how to fight as individuals rather than as part of a spear unit or anything like that. And and so they started to go around to captains, to sword masters, to beg them to teach them the ways of fighting. Now, a lot of them didn't want to teach the sisters this at all. They were kind of like, no, you guys just do your thing. I'm fine. I'm not going to teach two uppity princesses how to fight with a blade properly. When they encountered this problem, if asking straight out didn't work, seduction did. And so they were seducing their ways into more martial lessons and continuing to increase their knowledge of martial skills and warfare. Now, this is kind of the straw that almost broke the camel's back with the priest. He was like, look, you can't go around sleeping with captains, getting them to teach you different ways of warfare. I'm your teacher. Maybe there was a hidden jealousy there in the old priest, but whatever it was, he decided to then exclude them from ceremonies of Cain from then forward. So they were still an attendee of his. They'd like do his bidding, but they weren't allowed to attend the ceremonies, which really pissed off Helbrun. 
Now, being deprived on a stage to perform, not being allowed to go to the ceremonies, the popularity of the Daughters of Murder began to dwindle. They became less popular in the army, people would have less time for them, they didn't carry as much influence in the decision making. Now, what they resorted to at this point was holding their own ceremonies of Cain in secret. Now, the energetic and feverish performances of the girls really got them a fan base amongst the more die-hard Cain supporters, and they were much more entertaining than the more traditional ceremonies that the priests would do. And so they began to carve themselves out a little bit of a following for themselves, separate to that of the priest. But it still wasn't enough. They weren't progressing as they might hope to. Now the army she was with eventually left the city area, marched south all the way to the Badlands in the south of the Old World. And their scouting riders eventually came across an orc encampment with about 10 to 15,000 fighting orcs present and they had a target they were going to go for. Now as they did with every campaign, with every sort of pre-battle day, they had a ceremony of Cain. And during this showing with the priests leading the ceremony, only about a third of the army showed up. This is how sort of lacking in popularity the following of Cain had become amongst the rank and file of the army. So this just enraged Halbrun. She's like, enough is enough. When we started this, almost every soldier turned up to the ceremonies. They respected the cult of Cain. We have to establish it as the leading cause for this army. Bring back the crowd, bring back the popularity, and put Cain back in his rightful place. The Lord of Murder deserves nothing less. And so her and her sister sat there that night, the night before battle, and concocted a plan. On the morning of battle, it was an overcast and drizzly day. The army gathered in columns and started to march towards the orc encampment. They found the encampment itself abandoned, but the scout had found the orc setting up by the coast, and so the army got on the move. The army eventually caught up with this orc army on the coast and started to break columns and form ranks out of range of the orcs, but this was where the showdown was going to be. This is where the orcs had chosen to face down the elven army. As the orcs themselves started to form up, they appeared to be a tribe of savage orcs. They had some very primitive artillery pieces in the back that were a very poor imitation of the dwarven catapults. They had a group of trolls emerging on the right-hand flank of the army, looking to be a threat if they weren't chased away and this was the army they were facing down against 10 to 15,000 orcs, trolls, and various catapults. Now, the orcs started their offensive by firing the catapult, which fell a hundred yards short of any elven line, causing the elves among the group to kind of burst out into a little fit of laughter, which seemed to serve only to enrage the orcs, who began to jog towards the elf, who raised their spears, preparing for an oncoming charge. They were still some distance away, and the sisters made eye contact with each other with a look that said, if we don't act now, we never will. And so they broke ranks, charging in front of the entire army. They turned to address the army while stripping off all of their armor, throwing down their spear and shield. We need no altar to make a sacrifice to Cain, Helbrun started. Her sister Lyria followed up with, The battlefield shall be our temple, our war cries our litany. To slay is to pray. Helbrun came back in with, You call us the daughters of murder. Today we offer our blood and spirit to Cain, and dedicate ourselves to the Lord of death alone. We shall be the brides of Cain, she snarled. Lyrieth, let there be no doubt. We are Cain's chosen. We shall not hide behind shields and armor. If Cain wants our blood, he is free to take it. Out of the hustle and bustle of the army, the priest burst forward, saying, This is sacrilegious. What are you two going on about? And they simply grab him, 
kick him in the knees and knock him down to the ground. His attendees follow up quickly behind, but Helbrin holds a dagger to his throat and says if you get any closer, he'll die, which holds off all the attendees of the Priest of Cain. The army commander, being drawn out, rode down to see what the hell was going on. What were they on about? The army commander simply came down and was like, what are you doing? Aren't you the ones dishonoring Cain by taking his priest hostage? And they simply said to him, no, he is no adept of Cain. If he was, he would join us in battle. So we give this priest two choices. Pick up a blade and join us in sacrificing these heathens to Cain or die right now. And this priest is not a fighter. He's been a priest most of his life. He doesn't know what to do. And he's like, I can't fight. I have no martial prowess. And then the commander looked at him like, yes, these girls have a point. You've been coming along, traveling with my army, taking our supplies, our food for you and your retinue, but you've never picked up a blade and helped us in a battle. Helbrun's actually surprised at this reaction. She didn't think this would go so well, and sensing an opportunity to get the commander of the army on their side, she halts him as he begins to walk away, letting them do whatever they want. And she says, Commander... This is your opportunity to make this sacrifice of this unworthy so-called priest of Cain. Give Cain this first blood sacrifice of the battle. The honor is yours, Commander. And she presents the Commander with her own blade. The Commander seems to really gladly take up this offer and stabs the blade straight through the neck of the priest. Arterial spray is going everywhere and the girls get close enough to the priest and just bathe themselves in his arterial blood. Now completely covered head to toe in blood, the girls turn back to the army. Fear not, we will lead you on the path of true worship. Now, the army of the Greenskins had been approaching this whole time, and they were just about getting in range. The first arrows had started to fly overhead, and were very close. Not quite in range yet, but were getting there. Helbrun turned to her sister, the taste of the priest's blood still fresh on her lips, and they simply looked at each other and said, For Cain, my sister, let the Red Flood begin. And they charged into the approaching wall of green and metal. As they charged, Helbrun, so taken and having done her witch brew, which emboldened her and was a narcotic effect, that she felt like the blood covering her body was the strongest armor anyone had ever worn. And her and her sister soon became completely surrounded by greenskins, their ears completely filled with the grunting and snorting of these filthy beasts. They began to slash and hack at anything within range. Her first blow slitting wide open the throat of an approach orc. Another roared at her. She quickly stabbed him straight through the top of the mouth into his brain, quickly retracting her hand as his jaws clenched shut from the brain trauma and he collapsed on the ground. She heard behind her a clang of metal on metal. She looked. Another larger orc had taken a swipe at her back, but her sister had been there and had blocked the incoming blow. And both her and her sister with their other blades stabbed the orc through the chest. They became a whirling torrent of blades, the two of them back to back in the melee of the orcs. The rest of the army eventually joined the line, but the two girls were isolated in front of the spear wall. But such was the ferocity of their attacks that the orcs began to move away from them. They would just get cut down if any of them got anywhere near. Almost completely oblivious of the rest of the surroundings, the sisters just continued to twirl and slash, felling orc after orc after orc. Now, they had no idea how the rest of the battle was going, but in the distance, they heard a war horde, and the orcs seemingly began to retreat. Don't let a single one of them escape, cried Helbrun, as she charged after the retreating orc horde, and many of the followers of the army decided to follow her lead, although the commander was crying for them all to hold the line, to stay in position, but many were just caught up in the moment and began to chase down the orcs, slaying dozens if not hundreds at a time. Then, suddenly, from Helbrun leading the charge of chasing down the orcs, she heard a cry from behind her. It was Lyrieth. She shouted, Sister! 
Now Helper turned to her right hand side to see a rampaging unit of orc boar riders bearing down towards her. Those elves who had come out to chase down the orcs began to form a secondary spear line facing down the charge of these boar riders. But Helbrun was too isolated to get anywhere near them. Knowing that this could be her moment of death, she made a decision. She picked out the largest of the orc boar riders, locked eyes with him, and began to charge straight at him. She got so close she could feel the breath of the boar and the rider upon her. He darted down with a spear jab. She dodged it, knocking away the shaft of the spear. She leapt upon the snout of the boar, leaping straight over the boar rider, slamming down with her blade straight through the neck and right shoulder of the first rider, landing beautifully of all the grace of a cat behind him. Next followed another rider. She rolled to the right hand side missing him barely. A third again she had to dart and spin to avoid his blow but she managed to grab his spear slicing off the hand that was holding it putting the rider off balance and knocking him to the ground behind his boar which continued on with the charge of the rest. She used the spear to impale the orc's head straight into the ground and turned to face the others. At this point she was locked in. None were reacting quick enough to parry any of her blows. They were coming at such dazzling speed. She was just cutting a bloody sway through them and before she knew it, the orc charge had passed her by with a number of bloodied, wounded and dying orcs in the line that she had taken through the regiment. Now, she turned finally giving a slight reprieve to turn and see how the battle was going behind her. The orc riders who had come down were broken upon the spear wall. A wyvern had been completely riddled with bolter fire and had collapsed on the ground. The whole orc line seemed to be crumbling, but she suddenly felt a huge fatigue coming over her. The drug she'd taken had begun to wear off and the fatigue in her muscles had begun to set in. Wounds she didn't even realize she had had begun to make themselves apparent. She quickly topped herself off as she crushed the purple petal of the plant that gives her this narcotic high, the plant of Cain, reinvigorating her body's energies. And she looked at what was happening, the orc line broke and they ran, and the army was beginning to execute those wounded or left behind. Stop! She gave a cry. Stop killing them! Cain's hunger will be great tonight. The celebration after the battle was raucous and it lasted for days. Some 200 prisoners were taken and over two days they were ceremonially executed. Their hearts being thrown into the pyres of Cain that burned nearly constantly for the whole time. On the first night it was the commander who began the sacrifices by carving up the body of the priest he'd killed before the battle, throwing his wretched heart into the fires. Helbrun and her sister passed out the drugs that, you know, went along with any cane ceremony, making a point of allowing every single member of the army, from servant to soldier, to partake in the night's delights. The whole ceremony lasted for several days, and on the last night, they threw the last prisoners into the flames alive. The army victorious from this southern excursion into the Badlands returned with their treasure boxes full of loot that the Greenskins had obviously pillaged from elsewhere. Helbrun wrote to her father who said that news of the victory had spread and news of their deeds during the battle had almost become legend. Helbrun thought, yes, this won't be like the last time we were home. There'll be massive crowds, huge adulation. This is the way I climb the ladder. This is the way I I get back at Marathi. And so they ended up heading back home, although it took them a little while to get there. In preparation for her arrival, had, her father had written to her to tell her that he was organizing the biggest feast the city would have seen for years to celebrate their returning victory. However, by the time the sisters and the army got back to Atheltoralian, they were disappointed. There was hardly anyone on the streets to welcome them back, short of the friends and family of the soldiers. No one really took it seriously. There was a little stage built with garlands where her father and other city officials welcomed them, but this really embittered Helbrun. She was livid. 
This was the second time she'd been shunned by the city, despite her legendary deeds, and the fact that this was the city that had mocked her after the tales of what occurred between her and Marathi spread throughout the populace. She began to resent and hate some of the people in this city she once called home. However, her father said, look, darling, I'm sorry this happened. Uh, there was going to be a huge uh, turnout, but unfortunately, there's a trade convoy that's leading tomorrow. So a lot of people went to do their final deals with them and the harvest is coming in. So everyone was out on the fields getting the harvest. But don't worry, tonight's party will still be huge. Everyone will be there. Every noble, anyone who's anybody in the city will be there to hear your stories and to sing your praises. And so evening rolled on and the two sisters emerged late for this ball, dressed in beautiful crimson silk gowns, looking very elegant. This picture may not do them justice, but they're two very beautiful looking elven girls. And they were unusually for a ball of that type, both armed with twin daggers, which is kind of a faux pas, really, in elven society at a formal event. There's no need to be armed. They caused further uproar over the course of the dinner when their servants brought them their first glasses of drink in glass goblets. And it took a while for the crowd to catch on, but they were not drinking wine. They were just there drinking goblets of blood. And this set the entire party delegation sort of aghast. They're like, Oh my god, who are these women? What are they doing? And then there were a lot of the members of the other cults of the other elven gods present at this do. Now they were kind of a close-knit community of priests and alike. They all knew each other and they all kind of lived alongside each other. Some were in rising prominence. The cult of Cain at the time was not the most prominent cult even within the city itself. So one of the priests of the other elven gods comes up and it's simply like, hey, what happened to uh, our pal, the priest of Cain? And the girl's are like, we killed him. He was no true follower of Cain. And he was like, this is unacceptable. You women have to face justice. Like, no, the only justice we need to face is that of Cain's. And then they promptly slit this priest's throat from another cult. And he just lay dying, bleeding out on the floor, which brought a very prompt ending to the whole ball. Now, that evening, they're like, now we shall bring the teachings of Cain back to this city the way it was intended to be and they make a big show of taking out the corpse of this priest they just killed in the banquet out to the public square and burned his remains for everyone to see now this is not the time of the dark elves remember these are just normal elves of nagareth some are kind of okay some are cool with Cain, some aren't so many left in horror and shock at the sight of this unprovoked attack on the priest with his remains being burned openly in a public square what kind of desecration was this this was horrendous others were like yes Cain whoa a murderer cool but horrified or not, it was a huge crowd that Helbrun had brought to see her first ceremony of Cain. And as such, many came after her following the ceremony, looking to either join the cult, looking to see others they knew punished by the cult of Cain. Maybe they were not worthy and maybe should meet the blade of Cain and give their blood towards the god of murder. And soon enough, with all the gifts and everything they received, the girls Helbrun and Lyrieth began to set up a shrine of Cain within the city where worshippers could come and deal with them personally. Now, this did not go without notice, and many of the nobles began to sort of band together and like, we need to put a stop to this carry-on of these two daughter followers of the cult of Cain. The daughters of murder need to be stopped. They began to write to other colonies, they began to write abroad to Ulfwan, to Anlek, to try and rein in these two girls. Now, apparently, the biggest opposer they had to face was the most influence part of the nobility of Nagareth was in fact their mother. Now their mother and her father had become estranged many years ago leaving the father to bring up the girls but the mother who Helbrun had no more love for since she abandoned the family, Lyriev still had a great deal of affection for. And so Helbrun thought she shouldn't really act against her mother in risk of alienating her sister. 
One day when they were at home, their maid, who had been their friends ever since they spotted Marathi at the docks, and it was kind of like a half-sister, but still a servant, uh, came in and she said, I've got news. Apparently your mother's even written as far as a chap known by the name of Colandia. Now, Colandia at the time was the leader of the cult of Cain throughout Elvindom. And unusually, it seems that Helbrin hadn't quite heard of him, but then she was reminded by her sister, he was the man who taught our priest all the secrets of the cult of Cain. And she suddenly dawned on her and all the stories came flooding back into her mind, and they thought this might be a risk in its own right. But they still carried on looking to make Cain the most dominant religious force within their city. After some time passed, the kind of adulation around the cult of Cain began to slow and the two daughters of murder decided that they needed to have another big ceremony in the middle of the square now they came up with a dastardly plan and they'd learned through their spy the maid that one of the priests of the other cults had a lover who was a jewelry smith and so the two girls set out one night hooded and cloaked to track down this jewelry smith and they found her, they broke into her house, found their way into her sleeping chamber, and pricked her with one of the potions they know from their study of the cult of Cain. Now, this potion just made her highly suggestible, and they said, look, tomorrow you will come to the main square, and there will be a ceremony to the cult of Cain. When you get there, you will point out your lover, who is the high priest of one of the opposing cults, to that of Cain, and you will slaughter him in the square, dedicating the death to Cain. Now, go back to sleep. And the two snuck back out in the middle of the night. Now, come the following day, they got everything set up for another massive ceremony in the square, and lo and behold, the jewelry smith jumped forward from the crowd once the chanting had begun from Helbron, and was like... I know who needs to be dealt with by the cult of Cain. And it didn't that take anything to bring out her lover, this other priest, who was like, darling, what are you doing? This is madness. You have to stop. And she was like, just trying to, almost going at him, but there was some inner turmoil. She couldn't do it. And she simply said, I cannot bring myself to offer my lover to Cain. Will Cain take my sacrifice instead? And she jabs the blade into her own neck, drags it across her throat, and blood just spewed forth onto the the tiles of the square with the distraught priest falling over the collapsed body of his lover. He was enraged with the cultists of Cain. So I don't know how, but you had a hand in this. And they were simply retorted with something along the lines of, this is Cain's will. As Lyrief approached the body of the jewelry smith, the priest tried to stop them, shouting, no, no, you can't do this. As she plunged the dagger into jewelry smith's chest and ripped out her heart throwing it into the pyre they had set up, again dedicating the death and the blood to Cain. Praise Cain, led Helbron, and the rest of the crowd began to chant along with her. These were not the chants of devotion, but these were the chants of fear. Helbron knew it, and a wry smile began to creep over her face. This is how you get adulation. This is how you control people. Out of of fear. That is the kind of respect Marathi has. That is the kind of respect I too will have. Following the second ceremony, the cult grew even further, with many followers looking to join, others just looking to gift the cult presents so that they would not become the target of Cain. They hoped to avoid his wrath. Code for please don't kill me, you crazy bitches. Here's some gold. Now, with this money and with some of the help of their father, they got their hands on a villa and began to convert it into a temple of Cain where the followers could stay, live, and worship, and that's where they kind of set up their own court within the city. Over the course of the next year, the cult of Cain became the most popular religious sect in the city and was growing every day. However, dissent had begun to spread amongst the ranks. It had been a while since there'd been a decent ceremony, and Helbrun needed to address the situation. She began also to write to Colandia, the cult of Cain, back on Ulfwan to try and garner his support. And indeed, he did seem to back the two sisters, praising their zealotish nature and the work they're doing to grow the cult of Cain in the colonies. 
Over the course of the next year, she continued to exchange letters with the cult of Cain back on Ulfwan. They sort of became fairly consistently in touch about what they were doing. And the dissent amongst her ranks continued to grow, as well as the opposition. Now, once Helbrin felt that the cult of Cain was strong enough, she made her move. She gathered all the followers of Cain together one evening, got them all into a frenzy, and then proceeded to marched them to the temple district where they came across the cult of pleasure who were just you know engaged in their regular orgy stuff but they were a soft target all of her followers were arms they grabbed all of the mid orgy followers of the cult of pleasure lifted them up took them back to the temple of Cain, Helbrun and her sister themselves taking the high priestess, pinning her to a wall, slashing down the length of her forearm, they filled goblets and put in the purple petals that would get her followers into even more of a frenzy, and then they tore out the heart of the high priest from her chest, Helbrun herself being worked up on drugs and blood as she was in these ceremonies, took a bite out of the heart itself, sending all all of the followers of Cain into just a maddened frenzy and without being able to restrain themselves they tore apart every single one of the followers of pleasure there was blood from floor to ceiling in every room of the temple of Cain it was carnage by its very nature as the followers of Cain chanted his name and their prayers to him the next night there was retaliation against the Cain sect. Their homes were burned as they slept, and every Cainite who was walking the streets was attacked by another religious member. Helbrun soon retaliated and got her guys out and armed. By the third night of the conflict, it was open religious warfare on the streets. Corpses littered the roads. It was just chaos and slaughter. And Helbrun seemed to be winning, with her followers of Cain being more numerous and more vicious. However, the commander, the prince, their father had had enough. This had to stop. He couldn't have his citizens slaughtering each other on the streets. And he got his knights to ride down get to his daughters and he placed them under arrest. He had no choice. He had to arrest his own daughters. For three and a half years, Helbrun was kept in a tower outside of the city. Whenever her father would visit every few weeks or so, she would refuse to see him, turning him away at every opportunity. Although three and a half years isn't a huge amount of time in the life of an elf, the time passed extremely slowly. Every day was torture for Helbrun, who saw her ambitions crumbling to dust and being blown away in the wind. She'd gone through many phases, from trying to plot her escape, to trying to seduce guards, but it all came to none. She was well and truly trapped here. When, after three and a half years, being kept in isolation, her sister being locked up in another location, her father returned to visit her only two days after his previous attempt. Now, Helbrun was no fool. She knew that this meant something was going on. Her father would not return so quickly. So after such an amount of time, and despite being offered to be set free many times, as the sex had been closed down in the city for a year, but reopened uh, thereafter, but Helbrun would not be released, her father would tell her, unless she decided to renounce the worship of Cain. She always refused, and she could swear she'd see a look of pride come over her father's face. But, regardless of that, today she needed to find out what news her father was bringing, so she agreed to see him, and in that meeting, her father disclosed that something has gone down in their home province of Nagareth, that Marathi had turned against Malekith and was trying to usurp him and not allow him to return to the throne of that princedom. Now, you and I may know that this was the beginning of a ruse in which Malekith would try and take over the Phoenix throne, but but they didn't know that the way the news was getting to them. All they knew there was trouble at home and there was divides and fractures. Eladrian and Helbrun both came to the same conclusion that this would cause his enemies within the city to try and raise up against him and take over the city he was in charge with. He could not allow this to happen and he wanted Helbrun to help. 
Now, they concocted a plan that would take some time to do, but they sat back, made their ploys, and for another two years, her father put the pieces into place. He started to replace officers in the army with ones who were loyal to him or to the cult of Cain, and he started to do the political maneuvering needed to make their next big play work. So after this two years was up, he returned at the head of an honor guard to free Helbrun. Her sister was in the honor guard with them, and they all started to march on the city. That night, the temple quarter of the city was ablaze. Helbrun and the followers of Cain went killing and murdering throughout the city, all their enemies and the enemies of their father. Joined by his knights, they made quick work of those who would obviously stand in opposition against them, and they swept swept all their resistance away. However, they got news from the knights that there was something going on at their father's mansion. He was locked up and completely surrounded by those who would resist this drastic clampdown on any opposition against him. Now, leading this resistance was none other than their mother. Now, Helbrun was still very much in two minds about what to do here, but she got word from the maid, who was now a very high-ranking member of their cult, that their mother had moved against them, and if they did not show the strength, then they might lose control of the cult of Cain, because others within the cult, while the sisters had been imprisoned, had started to maneuver themselves in the position to take over, and any sign of weakness at this stage might be fatal for the two sisters and their ambitions. So they quickly made their way to their father's mansion atop the hill that overlooked the city. There they found their mother leading resistance that was for the most part largely peaceful, demanding that their father step down for this bloodletting within the city as it was simply unacceptable. Their father refused, standing on his balcony with other members of the cult of Cain who had risen up while the sisters had been in prison. Seeing them whispering into their father's ear kind of confirmed the story she'd been hearing from her maid and Helbrin decided then and there she was not going to let control of the cult of Cain slip past. As they dismounted from their horses to make eye contact with mother there was a strange look there that Helbrin recognized. It was pity but not hateful pity pity born out of love. Their mother was obviously trying to hold back tears for the bloodthirsty monsters she saw them as. There was still love there, but Helbrun just met this look with a hateful glare. Their mother implored them to stop this course of action, that Cain was a last resort for Anarian. Now, Anarian had played a key role in getting Helbrun converted to the cult. If it was good enough for the savior of the elves, it was good enough for her. But her mother retold the story, saying, Look, when Anarion was looking for ways to defeat Chaos, he tried everything. He dived into fire, making him the first Phoenix King. He tried every- he was at his last legs. He thought he had lost his wife and children. Then and only then did he turn to Cain as a last resort. Cain should not be your first and only mode of worship. That way madness lies. Please, daughters, there's still time to turn from the path of darkness to the path of light. You don't have to live this way. And even Anarion, in his darkest moments, never raised his sword against another elf. That never crossed his mind. How can you live this way? Look at all the blood you've unleashed upon this city. At that point, she falls to her knees in tears, imploring, clawing at the robes of her daughters, asking them, please... Please rethink this. There's another way. Your father's gone mad with power. Don't follow him down that dark road. Ambition is fleeting. We cannot take it with us when we pass on from this world. It's not worth it for all of this bloodshed just to meet your ambitions, girls. There is still time for peace. Please, I implore you. We can do this together. Helbrun, taken in by this emotion, knelt in front of her mother, and she kissed her on both cheeks, leaning into her and hugging her, embracing her, and while so doing, whispered in her ear, it's too late for peace. As Helbrun surged upward, slashing across her mother's throat, and arterial blood completely drenching Helbrun as she made the maneuver, 
Kane has come to Athel Torellian, she screamed. Give your lives to him or your deaths. Then she signaled to her followers and they fell upon the crowd, slaughtering wherever they found anyone who still resisted. And in so doing, securing the city for her father and for the worship of the cult of Cain. Over the course of the next few years, the sisters and their father secured power in their city and looked at the goings-on across the ocean in Alfwan at Nagarif. Eventually, Malekith and his mother exposed themselves and revealed that they'd been working together and Malekith made his play for the Phoenix Throne, unfortunately resulting in himself being horrific burned. At that point, Marathi needed help, and who better than to call from across the ocean for her son's trusted lieutenant, Alandrian. Now, I understand that I haven't actually given you guys much of a timeline for this. Now, most of this is occurring around the year, sort of the story begins around the year negative 2864. So, we've still got about 5,000 years, or give or take, till the beginning of the Total War Warhammer timeline. So this all happened a very long time ago. But regardless of that, Marathi needs help. She asked for one of her son's most trusted lieutenants, who by this stage had picked up a nasty scar across his face. Now, I'm not 100% sure where this scar came from. Maybe it's covered in a piece of lore I'm not familiar with. But their father has been horrifically scarred and has actually lost the function of one of his eyes at this stage. Whether it was from one of his daughters, from one of their enemies, I'm not 100% sure. If you do know, uh, drop a uh, sort of note in the comments below uh, with a link to the a place you found it as well, not just if you have a rough impression. That would be great. But anyway, he arrives and Marathi tasks him with one job. The biggest problem they have at the moment to the security of their ongoing war with the Elves, with the, what would become known as the High Elves, was one particular chap calling himself the Shadow King, who was running guerrilla tactic operations within Nagarif itself, cutting off their supply lines to their troops elsewhere on Off One, really just playing a massive nuisance and being a true hindrance to their war effort in the attempt to take over the Phoenix throne. He's happy to agree to this request and sets out on a hunt with his troops for the Shadow King and to put a quick end to him and his mischievous plots behind their own lines. However, quickly six years go by and he hasn't had any luck tracking down the Shadow King or how he is perhaps more popularly known, Aleph Anar. Now, not having had any luck, Alandrian returns to Marathi. Now, any other troop returning to Marathi having failed after six years in the field would have very much and realistically expected to be killed upon his return, but he had a plan and he just hoped he lived long enough to explain it to Marathi. So he arrives in Marathi's court and Marathi is asking for an explanation. He says, look Marathi, I don't have him, but I know how to find him. Now, we thought there was some kind of logical patterns to his attack, but that's not the way he operates. He moves through his territory like a wolf on patrol. That's how we can predict him. That's how we can track his movements. If you can send me all the incident reports of attacks on the battlefield within our own territory, I can plot his movements like a patrolling wolf. And then if you give me a scryer, a magician who can locate things then we can track him down because I can pinpoint a rough location because Nagarif is too big for any scryer to find him on a map alone but if I can pinpoint an area we will find him together and then we will kill him and she asks about how are you going to go about this and he goes I have two of the most deadly weapons known to our kind may I present you my daughters and that is when Helbrun is reacquainted with Marathi, along with her sister Lyrieth. Now, Marathi's only reaction to these two girls 
is the first time after seeing Halbrin for so long. There's no acknowledgement of their previous meeting, and we don't get the notion of what's going on in Halbrin's thought process, but she simply looks at them and goes, hmm, fine weapons indeed. So we don't know if that was a good enough, like, positive reinforcement for Halbrin, or it just worked her up even more for her hatred for Marathi. But that's all she says, and that's all we get of their conflict upon this second meeting of the two women. Now, all we get from then is some comments they make to their father after they leave the company of Marathi, and that is Lyria chirping up with, do we get to kill him now? And Halbrin just joining her and saying, I want to taste his blood. Lyria at that point says it probably tastes like a wolf's and they kind of go off on the hunt for the Shadow King. Now, what had happened in the six years since they left the city was that the elves loyal to the Phoenix King had began to siege it, and their father called back all the citizens, all his military, and, of course, his daughters. Now, upon leaving, Helbrun was a bit upset. She'd been leading the sort of head of the siege. She'd been holding off all these enemies, but the father said, don't try and keep it as a valid city. Burn the whole place to the ground. And so they left the shores of the old world to return to of one burning down their former city. And that's how they found themselves in the court of Marathi. Now, after some time, their father starts to get incident reports in, and he begins to sort of track smaller incidents, everything he thinks has to do with the Shadow King, Aleth Anar. And he eventually tracks down a target that he thinks they're going to hit next, which is this tax house, kind of out in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, where they store taxes before they return to the capital city of Anlek. Now, he thought, okay, they're going to hit this, they're going to try and take the money, this is where we can trap them. And they got the scryer, the dark sorceress that Marathi had lent them, to scry, and she managed to locate the Shadow King. Yes, we found him, he's there. And the little party head off to kill the Shadow King. So as the party approached the house, they could see the warriors of the Shadow King. They had found the right place and caught them red-handed in the middle of robbing the place. They quickly reacted upon seeing the approaching party of Druki and locked themselves in the tax house, barricading it, ready to fire arrows out and take out those who were approaching. Now, at this point, Helbrun's father just shouted out, I want the Shadow King, and then signaled to his daughters, and they kind of disappeared off for a moment, and come back clutching two elven children they'd managed to find hiding out somewhere. They held knives to their throats, and once they got the attention of all of the Shadow King's troops looking out the window, they slit the throats of the children and let them bleed out in the mud and the rain. As the rain continued to pour down again, the girl's father shouted out, I want the Shadow King. This time, they got an answer. The doors of the tax house were thrown open. Arrows came straight towards the girls. With blinding speed, both women parried away the arrows and charged the Shadow Warriors. They managed to fall upon them, engaging them in melee combat with almost supernatural speed. They dodged every missile fired at them as they made their approach. Within a blink of an eye, they'd cut down four Shadow Warriors without breaking stride and were charging towards the door. Only then did the Shadow Warriors have time to close the door before the two sisters managed to get their way inside. Helbrun Pausing for a moment in the rain, lifted the dagger to her mouth and licked its edge clean. More like dog than wolf, she said to her sister. Can we have some more playthings, she requested at the tax house. Can I keep one as a pet? Her sister Lyriath requested. The girls were clearly enjoying this slaughter and this sacrifice to Cain. The doors opened again fairly soon afterwards, and more Shadow Warriors poured out. The two sisters cut through them, hitting away arrow shafts in flight at them. The mage sent ice shards hurtling towards the Shadow Warriors, the servants of the Shadow King. It tore at their flesh. Some became pinned against the wall of the tax house itself. Lyriaf was going low on all the oncoming attackers, while Helbrin attacked high, and together, within moments, they had slaughtered almost all of the shadow warriors who had come at them. Lyriath paused for a moment, 
bent over and in the sacrificial way began to carve out the chest of one of the fallen warriors in order to pull out his heart. She managed to held it above her head and gave it an almighty squeeze as all the blood from the heart poured out down her face and over her body. She was reveling in it, and she just whispered out of her mouth, Praise Cain! At that moment, a hooded elf leapt out of the doorway with a silvery bow and unleashed an arrow that was quicker than any they'd seen before. They had no time to react. It tore through Lyria's throat, leaving her bleeding out on the ground in front of her sister. Helbrun let out an almighty scream and charged towards the elf who'd fired the arrow in a fit of pure rage. She knocked the first arrow fired at her out of the air, the second one she dodged with a spinning leap. She slashed at the elf's face, missing by inches. However, he moved directly where she wanted, in the path of the blade in her oncoming right hand. She caught him under the ribs and the blade drove up through the elf's body, erupting out of his right shoulder with a fountain of blood covering Helbrun as well. Bubbles of blood started to froth from his lips, and she withdrew her blade, spinning lightning quick, decapitating the elf in a single swing. Her father applauded as he bent down to pick up the silvery bow. Best we make this a gift for Marathi. As they stood over what had to be the Shadow King's corpse, they saw two figures emerge from the roof and leap away, escaping into the wood beyond. Helbrun was about to give chase, but her father stopped her. Let them spread news of the Shadow King's death, he said, and the party made their way back to Marathi to collect their prize. As a result of their glorious victory, Helbrun was promised the princedom of Kafik, and she began to set up operations there, having a sort of 24-hour sacrificial area where any prisoners taken in the region would be sacrificed to Cain, and this was her prize, and she would have to take it with some help from Marathi and Malekith's armies. But it would be hers at the end of the war, and she had wanted it to be dedicated to the god Cain. When they presented the bow to Marathi, she held up Helbrun and her father, as prime examples what the gathered commanders and princes and princesses should aim to be. One can only assume that this gave Helbrun at least some modicum of regaining her sense of self and getting one over on Marathi, although she technically was still just a servant of hers. But her ambitions hadn't left her, and she still aimed to surpass Marathi one day. And as part of her elevation, she was also also made a high priestess of the cult of Cain. Now I don't know if this puts her in charge of the cult of Cain at this stage, but she is very high up in its organization. Now on a side note, that was not the end of Aleph Anar. As you might have guessed, his men in a desperate bid to help him escape knocked him out, put on his clothes and took his bow, and it was one of his men who were killed that day. Now, we don't know if Helbrun ever finds this out, perhaps not before the, thing, before the events that are about to happen, but suffice it to say, you guys know, just wanted to let you know that Aleph Anar was not killed by Helbrun, but Helbrun's sister was killed by one of Aleph Anar's men, but not the man himself. Anyway, sometime later, Malekith has gathered his strength, and the elves who are loyal to the Phoenix throne before Malekith killed the last Phoenix King have assigned a new Phoenix King, and that is a king known simply now as Kalidor. Now, Kalidor obviously came from Kalidor and took the name after Kalidor Dragon Tamer, the legendary elven hero. But he had gathered the resistance of the elves still loyal to the Phoenix throne and had put up a resistance against Malekith. It was all coming down to one decisive battle, and that was the battle at Malador. The Witch King on his mighty dragon flew over the battlefield. Helbrun had gathered her mighty witch elves, which her and her 
sister invented, still one has to imagine seething with rage at the loss of her sister, looking to claim as many prisoners, as many sacrifices to Cain as she can find. And so the decisive battle started in earnest. From his aerial point of view, Malekith could see the witch elves, his vanguard, slice through the front line of elven defenders. They were seemingly going straight for the new phoenix king, and they came crashing into his bodyguard, his protectors, the white lions of Krace. Helbrun was leading the charge from the front. The first axe swung at her head. She dove underneath it, slicing at the arm that wielded it. The arm came tumbling away from the shoulder as the second blade followed up with a strike straight into the eye of the first white lion. The next axe came swinging at her, and she leapt straight over it, burying her two blades into the wielder's helmet, feeling him crumple underneath her. Now, the rest of the witch elves had begun to gather around her as they fought their way through the white lions. The next swing she had to deal with, she dodged by doing the splits and getting underneath the blow. In a split second, she was back up and sliced the throat open of the offending white lion. In the melee, she could see this usurper king on his dragon, just slightly beyond her reach. It was her goal to get there and to end the life of this protector. It would raise her status and maybe even elevate her above Marathi in the eyes of her king, Malekith. All of a sudden, out of her periphery, she could see a cavalry charge. It was the Illyrian horsemen coming straight at her and her company of witch elves. She had to react quickly. She somersaulted onto the back of one of the horses, putting her arms around the rider and slicing open his chest from behind. The rider fell. She then set about jumping from horse to horse, hacking and slashing at any of the riders she could get within her reach. Behind her, she heard the war cry of a charging cavalryman. He seemed done in all the regalia of a prince of Valerian. This was it. She didn't have enough time to react when suddenly she noticed that she was completely enshrouded by a massive shadow. Several massive talons closed around the charging prince and lifted him up into the air. Malekith, her king, had saved her. Suddenly, up above the air, another thunderous flapping of wings as this Caledorian Phoenix King rose up to meet Malekith after his killing of the Illyrian Prince. The two battled in the skies like gods when it was Malekith who came tumbling down to earth. He seemed to have lived, but shortly thereafter, Malekith had fallen into a pack of Phoenix Guard. He desperately fought his way out and escaped the battlefield. Once word of his fleeing the battle had spread, most of his army started to fall apart, including the Witch Elves, who without their king felt it was unnecessary to fight on and decided to retreat. In Helbrun's opinion, Cain's first must have been sated enough that day. Now, the Witch Elves and Helbrun are said to have broken to make it to one of the keeps protecting an area known as Nagnar. And her father, as well as his regiment, fled that battle as well, his regiment of knights. Essentially what happens here is Malekith leaves in a bit of a fit. He decides, screw this, let's destroy the world. If I can't have Ulf one, no one can. And he causes something known as the Sundering. It was his attempt to undo the Vortex, allowing Chaos to completely take over the world. But he was stopped through various means. I'm not going to delve into that in this story. But he was stopped. But the simple magical backlash caused a huge tidal wave to hit his own kingdom. Washing away many of the cities. But the Dark Elves managed to use their magic to protect them. And they became the floating Black Arcs. Floating cities that left Ulfwan and set up in what would become known as Nagaroth. Now, we have to assume that Helbrun at some point made it onto one of these cities that escaped the worst of the Sundering, or came along later. But Helbrun also makes it across to Nagaroth at some point in the story. Exactly how, I'm not sure, has ever been covered in Warhammer lore. Is it, if it has, please do let me know down in the comments below. On a slight side note, her father, however, is not so lucky. He does not get taken across in one of the Black Arcs. He's sort of left behind a little bit, and none other than Aleph Anar catches up with him and ties him to a tree I think for some slow torturing which no one's really sure how that ended I think he's just left to this tree that will grow 
slowly, grow high and tall, and kind of stretch him to death. I think was the idea, if I remember correctly. I might be slightly off on that one, but I think that's what happened to him. So, technically, one could hold that Aleph Anar is responsible for the death of both Helbron's sister and the perhaps death of her father, if not now millennia of torture of her father. So, pretty safe to say, probably not the number one fan of the Shadow King, our Helbron. Anyway, once Helbron gets to Nagarov, Malakif starts to set up his new kingdom there, the Kingdom of the Druki, or the Dark Elves. And he, in an effort to curtail his mother's power with her cult of kind of chaos stroke pleasure, he's like, no, this can't really be, I'm not gonna let my mother take over the religious leading of my new nation. And he elevates Cain to the official religion of Nagaroth and the Druki, and in so doing, elevates Helbrun at some point to the head of that religion. So she has become a hugely powerful individual, and yes, a power that one could argue could rival that of Marathi herself. So she sets up her own city known as Harganeth. Now, Harganeth is the only city in Nagaroth that actually has quite strict punishments for things like killing, for thieving, and all punishments are met with death, carried out by what would become known as the Executioners, which all hail from her city. Now, the Executioners were, I believe, set up during what's known as the, I think, the first great sacrifice of Harganeth, where soon after the founding of Nagaroth, a huge High Elf army invaded, and a lot of that army lost, but huge amounts of them were captured, which was a huge mistake on part of those High Elves surrendering. And what Helbrun did was she held days, weeks, if not months of sacrifices. They say the bodies would sort of reach sky high. They were piled that high of the sacrifice high elves to Cain. During this thing, she had to kind of devise better ways of killing them. She couldn't sort of carve out all the hearts themselves. She'd get some kind of repetitive stress disorder. And so she set up the executioners who would carry out the murder of all these high elves. She'd carve out the hearts, do all the ceremonial bits. She'd have maybe some of her attendants do it as well. And then she set up them as a fighting force who sometimes act as her bodyguard as well. Now, these guys ended up specializing in just expert killing. They sort of obviously worship Cain, the god of murder, but they're all about precision kills. How to kill with maximum efficiency. That's what the executioners are about. That's their approach to the worship of Cain. Now, during this great sacrifice, one up-and-coming young man known as Tullerus... Uh, became sort of enamored with the idea of the executioners, he joined up and became the greatest of their number. Now, there is some debate, particularly maybe in the Church of Cain, where Malekith, having named it the official religion, named himself the living incantation of Cain, kind of tying himself to the church as well. But there is an argument that maybe he's not, and maybe this sort of tutor, this protege of Helbron, uh, might be the real deal in effect. But that's another story for another time. So Helbron has her city now. She has her executioners. She has her witch elves. She has the cult of Cain. And later on would come the assassins of Cain as well. Which are all really kind of tied to her and her religious leading. Now once Helbron has herself set up. We actually don't hear from her for a remarkably long time. Next time we touch base with her. Is around the year 2378 of the Imperial Council. Calendar. Now that's very close to the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline, which we put at around the year 2500 of the Imperial Calendar. Now with almost five millennia passing since we darted our story with Helbrun as a young girl in Athel Turalyon, it's worth bearing in mind that elves are not immortal in the Warhammer universe. They live a very long time, but they're not immortal. Some of them use various nefarious means to extend their lives beyond their natural measures but no elf is technically immortal. So Helbrun, like all elves, unfortunately, the ravages of time have had an effect on her. Now, she, in her normal state, is now very haggard and old. She isn't the beauty she once was. She doesn't have the youth she once did. However, as Marathi has been doing, using the cauldrons of Cain, which she sees as her personal one, being a gift from the god Cain. If she bathes in the blood of that, uh, I think it's once a year, she has managed to maintain her youthful good looks. 
Now she uses this gift to appeal to Helbrun's vanity and hunger to get one over on Marathi to control Helbrun to a certain degree. She will not tell Helbrun the secret to eternal youth, but she will allow Helbrun once a year to, you know, have a few months where she's young again as well. Now, in this way, she can be like holding the carrot for Helbrun to do what she says, make sure Helbrun doesn't get too much out of line, and Helbrun kind of can't do anything about it until she learns all the secrets Secrets, and it adds to her seething resentment for Marathi to begin with. Not only did she hate her for the kind of complex she gave Helbrun as a child, but also because she's withholding these secrets from her. So Helbrun's animosity towards Marathi is not gone down. And Marathi's control over the eternal youth which Helbrun enjoys allows her to keep Helbrun in check to a certain degree, which might explain her lack of influence throughout large sections of of Nagaroth's history. Now, history did move on. Over the years, Malekith tried again and again to retake Ulfwan, unfortunately without much luck. The most famous example coming slightly more recently in, in the Warhammer timeline was the result of Tyrion and Teclis stopping his plan and fighting the decisive battle at the Fenuvial Plains. And now with Malekith having been banished into the warp by Teclis, the whole kingdom was slightly leaderless. And following the battle of Fenuvial plane, Marathi identifies a fighter, Tyrion. Now, Tyrion is the spitting image of her husband, Anarion, and it's just uncanny. In reality, Tyrion's just a descendant of Anarion and tends to wear all his old gear as well. So, you know, from a sort of passing point of view, you can see how she gets confused. But following this battle of the Fenuvial Plains, Malekith has been sucked into the warp and Nagaroth is leaderless. Now, she does make an alliance to seize control, make sure no upstarts try and seize control of the kingdom away from her and her boy if he eventually returns. But one of the schemes she dreams up is that, you know what, if we can't have Malekith, who better than Anarion to take over? So she arranges to have a small invasion fleet take what's known as, I believe, the Blighted Isle, and in so doing, she also manages to kidnap Tyrion. Now, the idea is to put Anarion's soul into Tyrion's body, thus resurrecting Anarion. Now, Helbrun, through one of her spies in Marathi's court, gets wind of this scheme. She's like, I am not going to let her have Anarion back. One of these things that gives her so much status to begin with with just being the ex-wife of one of the elves greatest heroes i'm gonna make sure this never happens she's not going to rise that high in the esteem of the whole of elvendom uh, and beat me again so she plans to have that undone and uses her spy at a critical moment to unbind Tyrion, who then manages to escape and gets distracted by Marathi snogging him to kill her, but she escapes from him, and uh, that's kind of the end of that story, with Helbrun putting a stop to one of Marathi's schemes. Moving forward again, about a hundred years to around the year 2470, Helbrun decides to kind of use her power to benefit herself and her city to a certain degree, and she declares a holy war, much like a crusade and she ventures around every Dark Elf city, gathering troops, killing a whole bunch of people in the name of Cain, gathering as many troops as she can. So once she's gathered this army, she sets sail, and she doesn't make landfall at her old uh, city of what is now Marienburg, but she instead heads towards Bretonia. Now, over the course of the journey, half of the army dies, because you know what? Those sacrifices need to keep happening for Cain, and so every night they'd sacrifice the weakest in the army to Cain, and they'd just keep it going like that. So they had half the forces... Now, militarily, that seems like lunacy, but that's the way she ended up doing it. So they had half the army they left with by the time they arrived in Bretonia, and they still had enough to cut a bloody sway through that entire kingdom, always heading southwards. Now, the only resistance they could get was sort of towards the southern end of Bretonia, and that was by Duke Bastille, and that was at the Battle of Nouvillon, I think it was. I'm not exactly sure where that is in Bretonia, but that did not go well for the Bretonians, and like Helbrun is one to do, the celebrations were raucous, many burning pyres of Cain, many hearts thrown into them, I'm sure many living victims as well, just a bit of a horror show all round, and as far as the Cauldron of Blood, which is a very sort of symbolic and very ceremonial uh, in these sort of Cainite ceremonies, 
she had a bunch of blood of damsels and grail knights, and apparently it was lovely. Anyway, she proceeded from Britonia through the border princes into the badlands, and then got to the lands of Nehekara, and that's the point where she was like, I've kind of had enough of this. We've made huge amounts of money from looting and pillaging. I'm going to go back home. Now, the looting, the raiding, and the killing in their own right were probably motivation enough, but if I can insert some of my own conjecture here, I like the idea of Helbrun returning to the old world all those years later, all those millennia later, returning to the Badlands to fight Greenskins, where perhaps in her youth, her and her sister had their most glorious moment, becoming the Witch Elves, the Things of Frenzy, the Tools of Cain, and maybe she was just trying to recapture that moment. That's just a little bit of my own headcanon for you guys there. Make of it what you will. Now, she did leave Tolerus, this up-and-coming executioner lord, uh, behind, and he had a bit of an adventure with the Tomb Kings, but again, that's not really Helbrun's story. Helbrun went home and took a whole bunch of money and stuff with her, and uh, that's kind of how Helbrun's Holy War Crusade went, ironically starting in Bretonia. Now, as far as Helbrun's rules on the tabletop go, she has two items, her two blades, the Death Sword and the Cursed Blade. Now, what the Death Sword does is, apparently, it's a beautiful blade that glistens with murder, it's described as, and that gives her a better chance to hit. It's a strong hit, so really, you'd be looking at the Death Sword as probably, you don't, I don't know if they'll combine the Death Sword and the Cursed Blade, they may well do, but the Death Sword itself would be probably translatable in Total War Warhammer as increased weapon strength and um, increased melee attack, really. Now, the other thing is the Cursed Blade, or what's known as the Parrying Blade, and that's more of a defensive thing. That would give her defensive bonuses, I imagine, if it's ever introduced in Total War Warhammer 2. The other item she has is the Amulet of Dark Fire, and what that does is it allows her to dispel magic easier. Now, there's no dispel mechanic in Total War Warhammer 2, so what it might do is allow her to become a bit of a mage killer, that's one interpretation I see it being as, in that uh, when she might have an aura effect around her, or even a map-wide effect that either reduces winds of magic amounts, or in fact um, maybe increases miscast chance or uh, increases cooldown to any mages within a certain range. Something along those lines would be um, a good way of representing that. But on the tabletop, it was a way to allow her to dispel magical spells that cast on her. Now, she also has something that the uh, Death Hags have, now, we've seen the Death Hags in Total War Warhammer 2, but she has some of the rules that carry over as well. So she has um, what are known as the Gifts of Cain. So she has the War Cry, uh, and she has, uh, which enables you to have fear uh, on the tabletop. She has the Rune of Cain, which increases her attacks on the tabletop. And she has the Witch Brew, which allows her to have Frenzy on the tabletop. Now, off the top of my head, I can't remember how those are translated across into Total War Warhammer 2 for the Death Hag. It's been a little while since I played as the Dark Elves, but I imagine those will just be carried over as they are for the Death Hags at the moment. And obviously, as well, with the... Uh, sort of following the Death Hag theme, she also has poison attacks uh, Helbrun will have. So all in all, probably she'll be a duelist. Um, I'd like to see her specialize in, I like the idea of the Amulet of Dark Fire making her a specialist mage killer duelist. That's kind of an interesting concept. Now, in terms of her mounts on the tabletop, she has a couple of choices. She could have a manticore. It'd be great to see her on a manticore. And she can have the Cauldron of Blood, which is kind of that big moving Shrine of Cain thing we've already seen in Total War Warhammer 2 as a mount option. Well, so we'll hopefully see both when she's maybe introduced in Total War Warhammer 2. And that's about it for Helbrun. Now, as far as um, I've maybe covered it before in my earlier videos, if you've not seen my sort of whole predictions for DLC, uh, do check it out in the top right hand corner now but i think helbrun will be part of a pack with Alariel, the ever queen i think it'll be an old ladies pack Alariel will get her handmaidens uh helbrun will maybe get the medusas i think which are an uh, element missing from the dark elf roster along with maybe a couple of other things but I think there'll be a download pack. Now, you could argue that Helbrun technically should have much more of a grudge against Aleph Anar, another potential legendary lord.
board for the elves. But I just think that um, with the lack of female generals um, in Total War Warhammer 2 alone, um, I think that they will introduce these guys as like a ladies pack. And that will be the theme. And it will be something like the Hag and the Everqueen. I've said this before uh, many times. But I think that will be the pack. There is a chance it will be an introduction with Aleph Anar, with him and the Shadow Warriors introduced. Uh, because he, she, he did really sort of kill her father and sister. Uh, but... That's a possibility. I just think it will be the Ever Queen instead. But that's about it for my Hellbrun video, guys. Hope you really enjoyed it. As always, a huge thank you all for watching, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. All right, guys. Bye.